I am so excited for the live tonight. Um, this has been a live a while in the making. So this live tonight is with Hope Edelman, who I've been so excited um, to have join us. I've been wanting this for a while since I read her book, which actually came out at the beginning of this year. And I'm really, really excited to actually say that this is gonna be her first live on Instagram, which is why it may take her a moment or two to get on here. She said she's actually um, used to doing this on Facebook, but has never done this on um, Instagram yet. So we're going to wait for her to join us and then we'll really get started. Your questions were phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. I found that some of you had read her books, which her most popular books are Motherless Daughters, Motherless Mothers, and her latest one, which is really some of the stuff that we're gonna be addressing today is called The After Grief, Finding Your Way Along the Long Arc of Loss. Um, so some of you had read her, her books, and so, oh, I see Hope is on here, amazing. Um, I got your request. Awesome, we're alive. Hi, Sarah. So good to meet. Look what social media does to us, right? We're two people who've never met, but like, I am so excited but that we're able somehow to know each other anyway. <laughs> right. Isn't this amazing? So it is I'm amazing. Just, I don't know if you were on for the last couple minutes, but I, I was saying is that I wanted to do this for so long, particularly since I read your most recent book. Um, I think it was about 15 years ago that I read Motherless Daughters. When did you publish it? Wow. Wow. Um, 1994 was the first edition, but then the second wow. edition came out in 2006. Wow. Yes. So I must have read it in like 2007, probably, actually. So what's okay. that? I don't even know. 13 years. Okay. It's 13, 14 years ago. And then I read Motherless Mothers. And those were mm -hmm. incredible. But I think what you've done with the after grief is completely, um, it's completely different in its own way. Meaning to, I think where motherless daughters broke ground because there was nothing like you say about right. grief period. I mean, other than like textbooks about pathologizing grief and stuff like that, there was really, there was nobody's personal experiences at all. No, um, um, well, you know, I, I the, I think of it yeah. as motherless no, daughters for grownups. A little bit. Take us on that journey. Take us on that journey for a second. What was sure. it like to write then? Happy to. Um, this book went through several iterations. I really wanted to write a book that I thought of as motherless daughters for grownups. <laughs> not, not that I wasn't a grown up when I wrote motherless daughters, or that the women who shared their stories were not adults. But I really wanted to examine what grief looks like, especially after early parent loss. 10, 20, 30 years in the future because my mom is still with me every day. And last month was the 40th anniversary of her death. So I had be begun this book as sort of honestly, what I think of now as a feel good book about grief. And just, it took years to get it off the ground and it went through several iterations and ultimately wound up being a book um, that we called the after grief that I hope creates a vocabulary for talking about this long arc of loss because I couldn't find any books that followed people for decades after a loss. I looked and no, it's, most, it's amazing that you studies. say that. Yeah, it's amazing that you say that because just to give you background because you are here for the first time. So let me just tell you my background is I lost my mother when I was nine. My father actually died about a year ago. And I founded an organization for kids and teens who lost a, a parent. This yeah. page is an outgrowth of that, of really the adults who said to me, we don't really have programming. And I said, you know, let's, let's bring some conversation to this page. And so what I'm finding is a lot of this audience are people who either experienced recent loss, but a lot of whom obviously this happened in childhood. And I'll often get DMs that just start with, I know I should be over it by now, so I feel really bad that this is still a thing. And I'm thinking like, I didn't have before this book a way to explain what I knew in my gut, which is like, no, <laughs> there's this thing that doesn't go away. It changes and it evolves, but 
no, there's no over it that people, you know, think. So I actually put a question box on the page and people sent in such great questions. So oh, good. we're gonna plow through some of those and I sure. think that'll get us into a really interesting conversation. So right. first of all, just for a second, just maybe introduce yourself to those of who aren't lucky enough to have read your books. Tell us a little bit about just your background and what got you to actually write your first book. Sure, sure. Well, I um, studied journalism in college. Well, I should start by saying my mom died when I was 17. And there weren't any books for girls like me. There were lots of books that assumed you'd be in your 30s or 40s or older when your mom died. But very little or nothing actually that I could find at that time for girls like me for a lay audience, you know, maybe some, there were academic papers, but I wasn't going to read those at 17. And I studied journalism. And I worked as a magazine editor for several years. And then I went back to graduate school to study nonfiction writing. And while I was in graduate school, I was encouraged to write the book myself because I still hadn't found it. I'd been looking at that point for about 10 years. And that's how Motherless Daughters was born. It became an international bestseller. There are more than a million copies in print. It's out in, I think, 14 countries and 11 languages. And um, I went on to write letters from motherless daughters, which were women writing their own stories. Motherless mothers, as you referenced, which is about how motherless daughters raise their children and the unique challenges and um, successes that we face. And then several other books before the after grief. So that's my history. Wow, wow. Um, so somebody, somebody asked, if there was a sudden death, let's talk about after grief for a second. Actually, let's let's go to a different question first because I think that'll explain it. She says, how would you define grief versus after grief? Like That's such a good question. That, I love that question. Thank you, whoever asked that. That's how the title of the book came about because I was writing, I didn't have a title. I had like a working title that was completely different that I, nobody liked, including me, but it was just a placeholder. That's what we call it. And I was, writing about how I'm feeling all these years later, you know, when, when a song comes on the radio and I have a, like a grief surge. And I kept using the word grief because I didn't have a better term to use. And I thought that's not a good one. I was looking in other languages. Maybe German has a word or Korean has a word and nobody had a word for what comes after grief. Um, it's not just normality. We all know that. It's something else. It's something softer. It's something that is like a low hum that's with us all the time. And then occasionally the volume knob gets turned up and then it goes back down. What's that called? So I was driving down the canyon road one day to the ocean and I was thinking, what comes after grief? What comes after grief? What do we call this thing that comes after grief? And by the time I got to Pacific Coast Highway, I thought I'll just call it the after grief. And that's how the title came about. But I think of the after grief as the phase that starts after the most acute part of grief starts to diminish. And that means the part where you really are just have the sorrow and the despair and the hopelessness and the helplessness and sleep problems and appetite problems. And it's like, it's, it's different for everyone, but it may be the morning when you wake up and it's not the first thing you think of, or it may be the first time you laugh uncontrollably again and you remember how good that feels. It's going to be a different transition point for everyone. For some people, it may be two months, six months, a year. But generally, I think that by about two years, we've entered the after grief. And if we are still grieving really intensely, you know, after a year or two, that might be what we call complicated grief, which 15% of the population tends to experience. And that's often helped by professional support. Wow. I love how you came to that. And I, I, I think that truly defines, um, you know, kind of, kind of how the grief process works. So the same person actually asked as a follow-up to that is, and I think you sort of answered that, but how would you define normal grief versus abnormal grief? And I think what she means by abnormal is probably what's complicated. And I guess that would be one of which is the length and time. Is there any other marker that you've seen? Oh, that's so interesting. Um, yes, it's, it's uh, often an inability to do your function in your daily life um, or your daily tasks. It's being like with the grief channel turned on all day long and all night. Uh, but I don't use the terms normal and abnormal because I, t I prefer the word normative. That means like how do most people respond? Normative and then complicated. And there's a center for complicated grief at Columbia University that's excellent that is there as a resource for people who are feeling that they can't really just can't function um, on a, even at a baseline level 
um, at, at a point where they feel like they should be able to. But they're really, I don't know, there's really no shoulds in grief. It's so individual. It's so different for everyone. And men and women tend to grieve differently. And it depends on your age. And it also depends on the relationship you had with whoever died and how they died as well. So that was going to be my next question that somebody sent is when you were studying the after grief, so to speak, did you find that there was a difference in the long-term effects for people where this was sudden or people who had like an illness and some prep time before? Yeah. Yeah. There's lo there are lots of differences. Um, if you have some prep time before you can theoretically do what's called anticipatory grieving where you start becoming accustomed to the idea that this person will not be there in your future. Um, painful and protracted. Not everyone can do it, but there's an opportunity for that to start slowly letting go and, you know, starting to create a story in which this will happen and this person will not be there. When someone dies suddenly or uh, without any warning, like an accident, a suicide, a homicide, uh, there's, it's very hard to make sense of what's happening at first. You know, the mind doesn't know how to put a story together. There's no beginning, middle, and end, and, and we're really lost without that kind of narrative structure to guide us. And also, there may be a very traumatic component to that if um, the body was harmed, um, if you witnessed or were in the accident as well. And then if you are not able to get trauma counseling or trauma-informed therapy, what very well could happen is that every time you try to grieve or you go to grieve, you bump up against the trauma and have trauma responses. And then that's, that's what happened to me. My mother was sick for 16 months, but she died very suddenly at the end and the kids did not know she was going to die. So we experienced it more like a sudden loss. And I would have trauma responses whenever anyone spoke about my mom or even whenever I tried to talk about her. And it wasn't until I could stabilize the trauma that I could get to the grief. And that took a good, like, seven years at least. Wow. That's fascinating. Um, someone asked, when you wrote Motherless Mothers and Motherless Daughters, there was little else with more grief literature on the market. Is there anything you would change about anything you wrote there or anything that you would advise differently? Oh, I love that question. No one's ever asked me that question before. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm telling you, people have good stuff. I wouldn't change anything in Motherless Daughters because I've had the unique opportunity to update it twice. So if it were still the original version from 1994, yeah, there's a lot I would change. But I updated it in 2006 and then again in 2014 for a 20th anniversary edition. So I don't think I would change anything in Motherless Daughters because I keep, you know, I'm always reading the new literature and adding new things. Motherless Mothers, yeah, I'd write it really differently. When I wrote Motherless Mothers, my children were little. I didn't have the experience yet of raising teenagers or raising children past the age I was when my mother died, which is a very significant milestone for motherless daughters and fatherless sons. And um, my daughters are now 19 and 23, so they're both beyond the age I was when my mother died. So I'd have a lot more to say about navigating adolescence and young adulthood from personal experience. Maybe that'll be a book for one day to maybe <laughs> to hear that. They, yeah, but now my kids are old enough to not want to be written about. So probably right. <laughs> it's very interesting that you say that because you were the one who actually planted in my mind that when you hit that age that you were and your child hits that age, like that could bring up the entire grief thing. It was actually in reading Motherless Mothers that I remember looking and saying, like, I had unreasonable demands of my children because I was used to at that age being self-reliant right. and all of a sudden I was right. like right but that's not how it should be <laughs> like if there is a mom in the picture that's not what exactly <laughs> right and you're I'm raising really them like, to learn things. how to manage without a mother right you're right. raising and them to like, learn how to manage without a mom when you're there yeah and I'm like why right and I remember like as I was reading that I was like Oh, so that's what this thing is. And it's, it's fascinating because now, like you said, you know, all my kids are, are beyond that age. And it's a very strange feeling, I will say. Um, somebody asked, what if I'm 50 years old and I never dealt with this entire grief thing? It's all new to me. I'm scared to actually open this all up because I won't be able to cope with this kind of pain. Ah, that's such 
Um, thank you for asking that question. I mean, at Motherless Daughters Retreats, which we were running in person before COVID, women would often come because they felt they hadn't opened that grief box and they needed to feel safe and supported and have a context or an environment in which they could do that. That social aspect of grief is so important. And we often don't have it, especially not years after a loss because people think we don't need it anymore. So uh, Motherless Daughters Retreats creates this space and a lot of women come and they have had childhood loss that they've never talked about or feel that they never grieved. But here's what I would say to this person, because it's never too late to do that, that grief work. Um, I don't believe that people don't grieve. I think everyone grieves to the ability that, or to the extent that they can at the time of loss. And if you were a child or a teenager, that may have been very little. Maybe just getting from day to day and suppressing the memory of the death was how you coped with grief. But that doesn't mean you weren't grieving. I think, you know, now this, this person who asked the question may be 50 years old now and have more resources and more support and a feeling that this is something I'd like to do now for me. Maybe it's holding me back. Maybe I'm feeling stuck. Um, and so that, like I said, can be done at any time. But we, only, we can only grieve to the best of our ability at any point in time. And so it just may be net that now's the right time to do that. But that doesn't mean that there was no grief occurring. You know, we often, women often look at men and see that men, you know, go back to work very quickly or, you know, start dating very quickly. And it looks like they're not giving themselves an opportunity to grieve, but men grieve through action and problem solving. And we shouldn't assume that going back to work or starting to try to date is not a form of grief for these men and a way to start working, to, to be working through their feelings, even though it doesn't classically look like the kind of grief we've been taught to, um, to look for. Um, most of the research on grief was done on female psychiatric patients in the middle of the 20th century. And yeah, so it overlooked a lot of male pattern grieving and it overlooked a lot of women's grief as well in the, in the normative world rather than, because it was looking at just the most extreme examples of women who needed to be hospitalized because they were having trouble coping. Wow, that is fascinating. It is. Um, somebody asked is that uh, having written an entire book for motherless mothers, what advice would you give um, motherless mothers? And what about motherless mothers grieving a mother who couldn't mother? Ah, well, so that, that's another kind of mother loss. I mean, there are many ways to be unmothered and mother loss through death is one of them. That happens to be the one that I work with most. But women can lose mothers to mental illness, to addiction, to um, narcissism, to incarceration, you know, to any uh, other forms of, of um, or foster care or whatever it is. Um, and that mother may physically still be alive, but be inaccessible to that daughter or have not been available to mother her the way she needed it when she was growing up. So the question was, what advice would I have for motherless mothers? Oh, gosh, I wrote, a wrote an book. entire book. Yeah, I wrote an entire book. I think it would be um, to, give, to give yourself a break. You're probably doing the good job you're worried you're not doing. If you are trying to be a good mother, you're probably already one. That's, that's, that's my advice. That's, Simple, that's but... beautiful. That's beautiful. Because I think motherless mothers tend to second guess themselves an awful lot. All the time. Because we're worried, <laughs> you know, well, we didn't, that we weren't properly mothered or we won't know how to mother or we won't know how to raise a child beyond a certain age. Or we won't, look, look, I've heard from a lot of women who said, I feel more confident having a son than a daughter because a, a son, I, you know, I, I, I feel like I could figure it out, but with a daughter, I'm missing pieces, you know? Wow. Someone asked this one. She said, I'm about six months out after my loss. I can't mm -hmm. imagine how anyone can ever feel happy again, but I do see people around me who've been through loss and they do look kind of happy. So I guess it happens at some point, but I have no clue how. Well, six months is a very short amount of time if it's a major and profound loss. Um, I can't give anyone a blueprint for how to find happiness again. I can only assure them that it will come. They will find it again. That every loss, no matter how devastating, will set in motion a chain of events that wouldn't have otherwise occurred. And eventually, eventually it will lead to something good and something that makes you happy. It always does. 
if we sit and we trace it back over time, we can always, I mean, I, my most stunning example is my daughters exist because my mother died when I was 17. Because my mother died when I was 17 and I couldn't find a book, so I wrote it. And because I wrote a book, I started a nonprofit organization. And because I started a nonprofit organization, I needed office space. And I rented office space from two guys in Manhattan. And one of them and I would share a cab home from work every night. It would drop me off and then go drop him off. And we became friends and we started dating and we got married and we had two daughters. So I, the chances of having met him and having these specific children would have been infinitesimal had my mother not died. So there were years when I couldn't imagine anything good coming out of that, but it did. You just have to wait. And you, you can see that in the long view or in the long arc. It, that will happen in the after grief, but after six months, the after grief probably hasn't started yet. Wow, that was beautiful. Um, somebody said that you speak about the rings of grief. Mm -hmm. And she wondered if you could explain that in general, the rings of grief. And I thought that was great because the people who haven't read the book don't know what the rings yeah. of grief are. <laughs> right. Well, I was looking for some kind of model, like a graphic model, you know, for visual thinkers that would represent how I think grief works over the long term. And this came out of all of the interviews that I did for this book. I did 81 or 82 interviews for the after grief in person you know, lengthy interviews and read them and, and, you know, categorized them. And the story that everyone was telling was about a loss that was terribly painful for a period of time, again, six months, a year, two years. And then so that, and that's what I call the red hot core of grief. That's the, you know, the inner core. And then they would expand outwards, you know, and feel a bit lighter and go back into what I call the middle ring, which is the ring of everyday life. And that's where we, you know, go to work and raise our children and go to school and make our phone calls and have vacations. Um, and although occasionally something might happen like a holiday or a death anniversary or a big life milestone where we contract and feel like we're in that state of intense grief again, but it lasts for a shorter period of time and then we expand back out into the middle ring again but there's a third ring that i call the outer ring which is the ring of growth and that's where the concept of post-traumatic growth comes into this story which is a field in psychology that has identified that a fair number of people are able to use trauma or loss as a springboard for personal growth it gives them a sense of meaning and purpose. It changes their worldview in a way that they can feel grateful for. Maybe it's that I don't sweat the small things, or maybe that's life is fragile and precious and human relationships matter more than work or whatever it is, or I'm going to start a foundation in the name of my daughter who died and raise money, or I'm going to start the Susan B. Coleman Foundation, you know, whatever it is. Um, it can be at the very personal private level or at a, a big public level. And I think of, you know, so the rings are, we're moving in and out because I think grief over the long term is a process of expansion and contraction. And so the rings are a visual representation of that idea. I think that, that when I saw that visual in the book, it was extremely powerful to me. I, I, I just have to like say for a second is that literally I must have like a whole bunch of pages bent in here. And I literally go back to them because I found so much wisdom. It also came out at the absolute craziest time in our lives. This book was published in the middle of COVID, if I recall, right? I'm like, you know, and is a that, was, that was really serendipitous, Sarah, because who knew, right? I mean, right. I, I, knew, I knew when I finished the book that it was going to come out that year but you know i finished the book in june and we it was bad but we all thought oh we'll be out of this by the fall and then you know the book came out in october and we were still in the thick of it but the most amazing part of this was that years before covid like a year and a half before covid we didn't of course no one knew covid was coming except maybe some epidemiologists but i was writing about the history of grief theory and I was also looking at how mourning behavior had evolved from the Victorian culture and all of its elaborate rituals to the very truncated versions that we have today, which is really, I mean, in Judaism, we have rituals for marking 30 days and a year and every, and then the death date every year. But, um, and Hinduism does, and Catholicism has some prayers, but not, I mean, for the most part, 
uh, Western culture has the funeral and the memorial service, and that's kind of it. Um, and even in Judaism, after seven days of Shiva, my family was just sort of back to status quo. But um, I was researching how that came about. And a big piece of that story was the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 to 19. And I went dead in the rabbit hole for about two weeks because I'd never, I didn't know anything about the Spanish flu pandemic. And I started reading about it and I was just fascinated. And so I did weeks of reading about the Spanish flu pandemic. I had no idea that it would become so useful in the future because when COVID came and I was doing interviews for the after grief, I could talk about how what we were experiencing now was so similar to what we experienced almost exactly a hundred years earlier, literally like 102 or 101 years earlier. Right. And awesome. how we need to hold on to the morning practices that we have because this is the kind of global and certainly um, national event that could take away some of the existing morning rituals because we had to strip back down on them in, during the COVID years. It's, it was unbelievable. I have to say that reading that in the middle of the pandemic in your book, I was just like, oh my heavens, about how it used to be much more of a communal right? grief and how we've become so isolated is as a society. And I think people just became really private about their grief, which created an unbelievable loneliness for most grievers. I think I always say when there's one word that you hear from grievers over and over again is this feeling of aloneness and loneliness. And I know right. when your motherless um, daughter calls, is that what they're called, the groups, right? I know. On when, every Tuesday evening, we have community calls for motherless daughters. Yeah. Really and yeah. I, I think that there's something about that bonding of being able to find that you're not as alone as you thought you were in Absolutely. this thing called grief. You know, I think that's, that's a huge piece. Um, somebody asked, do you find this in the act of grief is that I was doing fine. I actually was really back to normal, as the person writes. Again, that word normal. And now it's five years later and all of a sudden I'm really feeling like I'm back to my early throes of grief. Yeah. Um, that's the rings of grief. Something may have happened to pull that person back into the, the center circle, right? And then it's, you know, you sort of have to climb your way back up. Either it will happen naturally over time or you need to do it willfully, like with help from therapy or friends or a compassionate partner or a motherless daughter's group, if you're a motherless daughter. I mean, I would wonder what happened five years later. Was there some kind of trigger event? Because oftentimes there is. But sometimes it's just that we feel safe enough to grieve a piece of the loss that we didn't feel safe enough to grieve earlier. And um, isn't that a big deal? You know, I know that there were, um, I hear from uh, college students sometimes that their mom died when they were young and then they get to college and they ha sort of have this episode during freshman year that's a fresh, fresh grief. And we talk about how, well, maybe it's that you got away from the family of origin that, and they weren't letting you talk about your mom or there were certain rules in that family that you no longer have to adhere to every day and you have the safety and you know new friendships that may support you and so now you can let, let it down a little bit and grieve and do some of that processing you weren't able to do years ago. That is, that's, a, that, that's an unbelievable truth. I, I see that in my work with teens is that as soon as there's a little bit of independence and moving out and stuff and entering what we call the real world, it's all of a sudden like, oh, this is really scary. And I feel a little bit like unsafe or unstable and a lot of the, the pains will come back at the same time. You have them sometimes like they're becoming so hopeful about the future and it kind of also can be the, the trigger um, piece here. Somebody, I wanna go to some of the live questions as well. Somebody asked, um, how do you deal with being numb? Like, just no feelings of grief at all. Well, everyone grieves so differently. And um, that's a hard question to answer without knowing more context or being able to work with that person one on one to see if what they're describing as some type of grieving or processing. Um, if they're not feeling anything at all, is it because it's being suppressed? Is it because that's how they tend to work through feelings? Is that a family pattern? So how do you cope with it? I guess you find a professional or someone who is, knows what questions to ask and how to aid you through that to determine if it really is a problem or not. Because it sounds like this person is thinking this might be a problem. And it might be, but it also might not. 
it may be that you know this person processes differently than someone else. Maybe they're processing it very, um, you know, very intensely at the intellectual level, um, or 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 the social level, or but you know, if you feel that someone died and you, you you're worried that you have a lack of affect and you know no emotions at all, and that you should, that's often an indication that's good to ask a professional. You know, just run it by them and see, hey, is you know, is this on the range of normative behavior or should I pursue some additional help so that I can get in access with some of the, so I can access some of those feelings. Yeah, I love some of the questions that you just asked, even just getting us thinking in that direction. It's like, it could go in so many different ways. Somebody else asked here, do you think there's ever a point when grievers no longer need support or is there ever any kind of end point? Uh, you know, some people said to me, you can't write this book and tell people that grief never ends. You're going to scare people by saying, you know, they're going to be grieving for the rest of their lives. And, and I said, I'm not saying people are going to grieve actively for the rest of their lives. I'm saying they're going to love this person and miss this person for the rest of their lives. And isn't that a beautiful thing? And if some of if that means that, you know, occasionally we're still going to feel some pain over missing them, then that's indicative of how much we loved them to begin with and probably how much they loved us as well. So if the question was, will, will we always be in a state of grief? We'll always be in the after grief. I'm not sure I would say we will always, it will not always be the kind of pain that we felt in the first year or two. Um, but we will always miss that person, sure. If, if it was a close and loving relationship, if it was a complicated, problematic relationship, we may feel a form of relief when it ends and that's okay too. And then we may feel guilt over that relief, which is very normative as well. So, you know, there are, grief comes with many, many emotions in the package, depending again on the specific relationship. On the we had. Right. Exactly. Right. Um, somebody asked, how is losing someone during COVID different than any other? I'm going to get to that in a second, but I see on the screen someone saying, your books were my saving grace in high school, my Bibles, you saved me, you validated my grief when no one would talk to me about it. That touches my heart so deeply because that's what I needed in high school. And most of the time, this is just the work I do. And I think this is what I do. I get up usually in my yoga pants or pajamas and I'm at the computer. Um, but I occasionally go into my office and get very professional and it's a job. But then I step back and I realize that this work is giving girls and women what I didn't have. And I feel so humbled and so grateful to be able to do that because I so wish it had been there for me. Okay, so um, how is co grief during COVID different? Well, we haven't been able to rely on the familiar and comforting rituals that no we would normally expect to have. We haven't been able to gather communally or socially. So Zoom funerals and, and memorials became a real thing. Um, I think it's important to, post to, post to not necessarily postpone, but to also have in-person celebrations when the time comes, celebrations of life perhaps, because people come and get together to laugh, um, to hug each other, to be in you know, the company of others who remember that person is so very important. And we lost that during COVID. People had to grieve really alone, especially if you lost someone during the quarantine or the lockdowns. That was so incredibly hard really any form of grief. I went through a divorce, a separation, unexpected separation at the very beginning of COVID. And I didn't have my girlfriends to spend time with, you know, to help me through it. And I had to process it mostly on my own. I was home with my daughter. And I think, how did I get through that? How did anyone get through losing someone to death during that time? I mean, I know people who did and I just, my heart goes out to them, it's so hard because you're really just alone with your own story. You know, you're alone with roaming the facts over and over in your mind, trying to make sense of what happened, trying to, you know, get right size with it. And we can't, we were, you're able to bounce it off of people by phone or by video chat, but it's not the same thing as being in the presence of a living being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that you really zeroed in on, on what that was for people. It was just, it was a stripping of whatever is left of our community in terms of just the closeness, like you said, we already stripped down from the fact that it used to be a real communal morning and it became smaller and smaller. We took that last pigeon of what was left and we like sliced that and diced that off. And it was, it was That's just terrible. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. what happened. That's why it's so important that we get back to where we were as soon as we can. 
But I do think that the Zoom funerals or, or live streaming a funeral, I hope that stays and that services become hybrids in that way because it will allow people who can't travel on short notice or can't take time off of work or have no one to watch the children to still be part of the memorial or the commemoration. And that allows the village to come together to mourn the loss of one of its own in a more expansive way. And it's important for the mourners too, to feel that they're part of it. Because before that, if you couldn't get to a funeral, you just weren't part of it. You maybe could put something right. online, but you couldn't really participate. Right, right. No, I, I think that that, I, I agree with you. I know for myself that there were several that were out of state or out of the country. And it was just for me, there was something very special about being able to participate in it, albeit from afar. And like I said, you know, I don't think it replaces the in-person, but I hope it stays as an addition too. Um, someone said, Stephen Colbert, yeah, talks about not really grieving his father. You actually bring that in the book. Um, and brothers who had died in a plane crash until he got to college. I didn't realize that was typical for people. Yeah, you know, I hear that from people all the time about the fact that they're always shocked that there are other people who don't grieve until later also, the whole delayed grief piece also. I did not know that Stephen Colbert said he didn't grieve for them until he got to college. That's interesting. Cause so, I, Stephen, yeah, I, I did not ahead. see that in the Anderson Cooper interview. He may have said that somewhere else. I'd love to know where he said that because Stephen Colbert and I were in college together. We were both really? class of 1986 at Northwestern. So I wish I'd known him back then. He came in as a transfer student, but yeah, we were in the same graduating class at Northwestern. Small claim to fame there. Yeah, I was going to um, say, this must be an interesting uh, thing to watch. Yeah, It is. But um, but if, if those who are watching have not seen the CNN inter interview with Anderson Cooper and Stephen Colbert, especially the portion where they both talk about losing their fathers at the age of 10. And um, Anderson Cooper also talks about losing his mother, Gloria Vanderbilt, as an adult. And Stephen Colbert talks about losing his father and two brothers in a commercial uh, airplane crash when he was 10. He says something that's so profound in this interview. He says that he had to learn to love the thing he most wishes had not happened. And I think, wow, that is such an example of grace after loss. To learn to love the thing you most wish had not happened. And I think one way we do that is by realizing what, you know, what that terrible tragic event can lead to the good things that it happened to. And you can love those things. That doesn't mean you're happy that people died, but you can love the whole arc of the story in a way that still honors the love for the person who you lost, but it also makes room for gratitude for what you were able to gain. Does that make sense? Yes. I remember seeing that interview and it was, it was an extremely moving interview. And like, I would absolutely encourage if anyone hasn't seen it to go watch it. Um, someone else wrote something so beautiful. She said, same here. I read Motherless Daughters over and over again the year after my mother passed away. I, I can tell you, people, when I put that we're going to do this live, the outpouring of this has been one of the most validating works for so many people. I'm just curious, and this wasn't a planned question, but I'm curious, is there anyone who has done this for fatherless sons? Is there any research in that world at all? There is. There is, um, there's a good book called, uh, I think it's called Father Loss by Neil Chethik. It came out, I think back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, maybe I'd have to take a look. It's quite, it's quite good. Um, it's not specifically about early father loss. Um, there's another good book by Maxine Harris called The Loss That Is Forever. It came out in the 1990s, but it still holds up really well. And it's about any adult who lost a parent when they were young. And, you know, whether you lost a mother or father, whether you were a daughter or a son, it covers all those bases. And it's quite good as well. Um, yeah, someone else was writing, and that's true, that the doctors didn't allow them into the hospitals at the last minute. That was also something that part of COVID losses was. Oh, yes, of course, that we didn't to get to, that we didn't get to be with our loved ones when they died, but also that we carry the sadness knowing they didn't get to be with us. And, and, and like and, the person writes, I think that made my grief very complicated. I agree. I, I think that that does make the grief um, more complicated. Somebody else wrote, absolutely. I found your book in my junior year in high school, and it was my only comfort and validation. 
That's I see, so beautiful. I see Randy here who said father loss for girls too. Randy at Grief and Grits. Hi, Randy. Um, yes, um, okay. there's a book called The Fatherless Daughter Project that's, that I love right. by, read by Dena, Dena yes. Babel. And that, that is like the motherless daughter's equivalent for fatherless daughters. An excellent book. And the one who said, by the way, about Stephen Colbert's statement says it was in his Oprah interview. Okay. Oh, okay. I'll so, take a look for that. Thank oh, you. you got to go look for here. Okay. We'll go back to a couple of other questions that were submitted. Um, somebody said, I was an infant when my father died, so I have no memories of yeah. him at all. I kind of go from feeling guilty for even grieving sometimes because I feel like I'm grieving something that I didn't even know. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, my grief can get really intense. Like in a way, my loss feels like more than other people because I'm losing, I'm grieving someone I never knew. Mm -hmm. It also feels really weird because I don't really miss anyone. I miss this thing that I don't even know. Any advice? You know, very early loss is its own category and it's a very special category. And at the motherless daughters retreat, sometimes if we have a group of women, we were, we were doing them with 26 women at a time. Um, now we're gonna start them up again in November just with 12, but we're going to do a special motherless daughters retreat just for very early loss for motherless daughters who have no memories of their moms because their grieving is a very special kind of grief because they are not just, they're not necessarily grieving the loss of a person, certainly not a person that they knew, but they're grieving an absence. They're grieving some, you know, they, the, the space in their lives, you know, that was never filled. They're grieving um, an image or a dream or, a, you know, someone else's memory of who she was or someone in a photograph that they don't feel any connection to. But there are, it is true that even if you spent a small amount of time with your mother, unless in fact she died during childbirth, there were imprints that she left on you, just not, they're not conscious, they're not memories that we can retrieve necessarily but the way we were held, the way that we were cared for, um, the songs that, or you know, the sound of her voice, it, it was imprinted on us even if we can't recall it as memory. And, and our bodies you know, carry some memory too. So I'm not sure that we're not grieving, that we, that we can't grieve. I think it's all pre-verbals, you know, so we're grieving something that we can't retrieve as a memory that we can recognize, but we might be in some way grieving, you know, that, that the feel of her skin or the sound of her voice um, in a very, you know, early kind of very pre-verbal, like inchoate memory. Wow. wow. Um, okay. Somebody said also that she's older. I don't know what she calls older because if you know how to use Instagram, I mean, good for you, then you're young like anything. <laughs> she says, I'm not used to speaking about my grief or my mother. What would you say is the best way to start talking to a friend without making things awkward? Ah, um, well, you mean just to bring it up if you have a friend that you trust and you I want guess to she talk wants about to it. start a yeah. little bit and she yeah. just says, like, how do you do it? <laughs> oh, I would honestly not trying to be self promotional at all, but I would go to motherlessdaughters.com and look at the Tuesday motherless daughters community calls. We keep them really low cost and there's four calls a month. And there's opportunities to meet other women whose losses are similar to yours, but there's open conversation time too, where you can start testing out what it feels like to talk about the loss. And the women stay on the line, you know, for an extra 30 minutes of open conversation, just because they love the opportunity to share their stories and, you know, support each other. And we're building a real community of people who come month after month and are really getting to know each other. They're coming from Germany and Australia and Chile and all Canada and look forward to seeing each other every Tuesday evening. I look forward to seeing them too. I'm there every Tuesday. But in, you know, about when you're talking about a specific friend maybe that you wanna to talk to or you know, a, a partner even, um, it's often good to say, um, hey, you know, I wanna, I'd love to talk with you about something I don't talk about very much. And it might feel a little awkward or uncomfortable for me at first, but I'd love to share this part of me with you. I wanna tell you a little bit about my mom and start with who she was. It's a really easy way in because then you're not starting with the death or the tragedy. I wanna tell you a little bit about my mom and who she was or who I heard she was or who I believe she was. And you know, I don't talk about her much, but I'd really like to be able to share a piece of her with you. And then that will often lead into a conversation about what happened. But when we start with, I wanna talk with you about how my mother died. Sometimes that is, you know, for, you know people are not great at 
you know, talking about death, and that might be a little off-putting. It's not really your job to make people feel comfortable if you need grief support. But if you are concerned about how to start a conversation, starting by, just by talking about that person and who she was in the world or who she was to you is often a good starting point. Love that idea. And I like the way you said about, like, who I heard she was. Like, if you didn't know her well yeah. or if this was early loss, that's such a great idea. Um, okay, one or two more questions. Somebody said, um, hmm, let's just go through um, these. Wait, can... answer, I, I want to answer Shannon's question because yeah, I see it sure. here. She says, I've never met a daughter who lost their mother to murder. I wouldn't wish it on anyone, but I wish I had someone who relates. Shannon, there are women in our community who have lost their moms to murder. Yes. Um, and they will welcome you and they, they, they understand what it's like. And there are women who come to the retreats who also lost moms to homicide. We had one retreat where it just by chance there were three women who had lost their moms to murder and that first night they sat out on the front porch for hours together talking because they had an experience that nobody else in the group had had you know it's it's a violent loss it's often in the news so there's public you know the public weighs in on it and there may be a trial and um it may be also i, I mean i work with women who have um you know their their fathers often are the perpetrator of the, of the murder. So they lose both parents. parents at the same time. Allison Moore, who's going to be a guest next month on the Motherless Daughters Community Calls, lost her mother to murder. Um, and her father was the perpetrator. And she and her sister Shelby Lynn, who's a, a singer, they're both uh, performers in Nashville, singer songwriters, um, then, you know, made it through the aftermath of that. They were both teenagers when their mom died, when their, she was shot by their father. So really, Shannon, I, I do encourage you. I've seen the community calls, and I think that, you know, that it's something that you should definitely visit. It can be so supportive. There is a comment here that I missed before. My mother died when I was in high school. Now, almost 20 years later, I feel like I'm mourning someone that didn't exist, a saint. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. she could do no wrong when I know deep down she wasn't perfect. Right. That is so common for many people because after people die, we write, rewrite history completely. Absolutely, and they're that. sanctified. And I don't think we can grieve someone fully until we grieve who, all the elements of who they were. You know, I got pushback when I wrote Motherless Daughters from some of my family members because they wanted to remember my mother as a saint. And in Motherless Daughters, I tried to portray her as the very complex, complicated person that she was to me. Maybe she wasn't a complicated person to others, but she was to me. And, you know, she died when I was in the throes of adolescence and there was a lot of push-pull we were arguing a lot and I wanted to be honest and true to the relationship we'd had and let her be human. I felt that grieving her, mourning her, her and honoring her as the full and complex human being that she was, was the best way to commemorate her. And I would wish that my daughters would do the same for me, honestly. Um, which makes me think of something else, which is, do you, I wonder how many women here or listeners here today we're told um, not to cry or not to grieve after their moms died because their mother wouldn't want them to be sad. I heard that from so many people. And I just thought, what the heck? Like, so if I'm sad, does that mean I'm like dishonoring my mother? Like, so I guess I just shouldn't talk about it because if my mother wouldn't want me to be sad and I'm sad, I'm, I'm not being a good daughter. So I'm gonna say something now, which is this. To any, you know, I'm saying it specifically to my daughters if they ever watch this. I would like them to be sad when I die. <laughs> I would. I would like to have been a good enough mother that they will miss me and they will be sad that I'm no longer here. I do not want them to be incapacitated by that grief. I would like them to have my work to rely on and the work of others and to be able to work through it and be happy again as soon as possible. But I would never want them to not be sad if that's what they're feeling. So I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> I love that you said that because I think for so many of us, um, we've heard it. We've heard it said to others. We've heard it said to us. Um, I like Dr. Cosmos' comment. She said, it's another loss when people don't allow us to own the entire story, making us sanctify the dead, which erases our story. 
And I think 100%. And I also think that not allowing children to grieve is actually a form of emotional violence. And I know that sounds really dramatic, but I think that not allowing a child to express their feelings when someone as important as a parent dies is, um, it, it is, a, I think it's an abusive act, frankly, because I have seen the lingering effects of that on adults decades later, and it does a lot of damage. It really, really, really does, especially when, yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of stuff. Sadness identifies a loss. I'd like my kids to feel that I was valuable enough to be a loss. Yep, like yes, I said. Yes, that's what I mean. That's what and I'm saying. somebody said, my father often told me I used up all my tears for my mother. Nobody or nothing else was worth it. Oh, wow. You know, people, people definitely say things, which brings us to one of our last questions. Somebody said, what's your best response when you hear somebody say, like, why aren't they over it yet? Or any of those kind of comments, which signify like grief has a nice, neat beginning, middle and end. How do you respond? I just simply say, that isn't how it works for most people. That's not how it works for me. That's it. You know, it sort of pushes them their own point of view back into them. In my coaching circles, we talk about if someone tries to hand you a package and you refuse to receive it, who's left holding that package? If someone tries to hand you their anger and you refuse to take it on, they're left to deal with their anger alone. If someone tries to hand you their judgments about the way that you're grieving or their opinion about how grief should go and you refuse to take it and you set the boundary that just says that's not how it is for me, then they're left holding that judgment, right? And not that, yeah, because we shouldn't have to take on that criticism because it's not fair. Everyone grieves differently. And this is why the introduction to the after grief is called getting over getting over it. Because I think we just have to get over the idea that grief is something that we get over. Thank you. I see Adina clapping on, yes. in the comments. Yes, it's Adina. like yes. literally, right? as I Let's read it, that was one of the first things that I saw. And I was like, somebody said this aloud. Thank you. Like, you know, I think also the getting over it movement has created so much unneeded guilt. Like the fact that the DMs have to start with like, I, I know I should be over it. Like how we started this interview is just like, why do you have to carry that should? that should doesn't have to exist. Like this just doesn't work that way. Because there's this cultural prescription for moving through these sequential linear stages of grief and getting to a point of acceptance. And it's, you know, it's bonkers really, because even those stages of grief were not created by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross for the bereaved. They were created to explain the experience that the terminally ill had when they were dying themselves and that ultimately they would come to acceptance, acceptance that they were going to die and there was nothing they could do to change it. It doesn't fit with bereavement at all. What no. we get to is, a, a, I think, a, a, you know, a, a, a point of adjustment or a phase of accommodation, but acceptance always seemed like such a weird one to me. I remember sitting on my bed and looking at this pamphlet about the five stages of grief right after my mother's funeral and just going down the list and checking, I was like, okay, denial, no, we just buried her, I'm not in denial. Anger, no, anger, you know, that, that does, I was already angry, didn't work. Bargaining, bargained when she was in the hospital, God didn't listen. Um, uh, depression, no, I'm not a depressive kind of personality. Acceptance, uh, this doesn't feel like acceptance, but I guess that's where I must be, so okay, acceptance. And um, it, none of those really fit me. And even Elizabeth Kubler-Ross herself said, my God, you know, these, we can have two or three of these feelings at the same time. There are many others we might feel. We cycle around in them. It's not this kind of lockstep linear progression, but it was such a seductive idea that we could just go through you know, these five stages and then we're done. It feels good for other people also. And I think I wanna close with this up. Somebody posted a question and said, thank God I've never experienced the loss of anyone, but I have so many people close to me who've lost mothers. What is the best way to support them? It, there's something called companioning others in grief. And it's just being a compassionate and um, active and engaged listener. Um, and just approaching their, their experience with curiosity and compassion. Um, not, is there anything I can do for you, but just, what is this like for you? You know, how are you feeling today? Not just, how are you doing? But how, are you, how are you feeling today? Or how are you feeling this hour? Or um, I'm here just to listen. 
whenever you know you may need someone to listen to you not whenever you want to talk but whenever you i'm here whenever you need someone to listen and um being there as a sounding board for them to and and not judging them and allowing them free expression of their feelings i think is the the kindest and most generous gift that we can give someone who's in mourning that was so beautiful i can't thank you enough i feel like you know i i was asking the question so i wasn't able to take notes but i'm going to go back and re-listen because there was so much gold in here Aww, and i really want to thank every single person who submitted a question your vulnerability and your depth was incredible and really i think i always say that whenever we do these q and a's i think and this is similar probably to the calls that you do i think other people's experiences help somebody else so your question was somebody else's question also and so i really I, I thank you for sharing that. And I thank you, Hope, for being here. And not only for being on this live, but for creating really, I think, guidebooks for all of us as grievers that have been powerful for me personally and powerful for me professionally. Thank you so much, Sarah. It was a pleasure to do this. I was so happy that you asked. <laughs> I'm grateful. Have a wonderful night, everybody. And thank you. And Hopefully Instagram will save this live. I'll share it with you. Hope you can share it with your followers. I'd love that. And we'll be able to watch this and rewatch this. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. I love it. Have a wonderful Thanks, evening. Take care. Thanks so much.